Oral questions, question oral, the honorable member for Regina Capel. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister told Canadians not to worry about his massive deficits and borrowing and spending because he said interest rates would stay low for a very long time. Then he turned around and pumped $400 billion into Canada's biking, ba banking system, causing prices to rise. Now to fight inflation that the Liberals caused, the Bank of Canada has again jacked up interest rates. And for the average mortgage in Vancouver, that means families will have to find another 19 hundred dollars a month just to stay in their own homes wow. so has the government been briefed on how many Canadians will have to turn their keys over to the bank as they struggle to pay these rising mortgage costs the honorable parliamentary secretary Mr. Speaker, we've put a fiscally responsible affordability plan on the table in this House, and it'll be my pleasure to answer questions on the economy today. But, Mr. Speaker, the new Conservative leader hasn't answered a single question from journalists in nearly 50 days, Mr. Speaker. Canadians don't have the luxury of doing some of their job and not other aspects of their job. So if the new Conservative leader would like to take home his full paycheck, paid for by the Canadian taxpayer, he needs needs to answer questions from journalists in the press gallery today. The Honourable uh, House Leader for the Official Opposition. Well, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister hasn't answered a question in this House in seven years. And we're here answering questions on behalf of Canadians who are struggling to pay their mortgage costs just to stay in their own homes. The typical family in Hamilton who now has to renew their mortgage payments will have to come up with an extra $1,300 a month just to stay in the home that they've already been living in. The Prime Minister said that he was going to go into debt so that Canadians didn't have to. So where should families in Hamilton send the bill for their higher mortgage costs? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, families in Hamilton and right across the country will receive in a few days a doubling of the GST tax credit, Mr. Speaker. And this feigned compassion from the Conservatives opposite, the day after they vote against providing supports to Canadians in the form of direct payments for those Canadians having trouble paying the rent, after, the day after they voted against subsidizing dental care for Canadian children, Mr. Speaker, this feigned compassion from the Conservatives is fooling no one. Well done. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. What we're against, Mr. Speaker, are the inflationary deficits that this government is causing. The reasons why prices are going up today is because the government flooded the banking system with $400 billion of brand new cash. And now Canadians have to pay for it. Again, a typical family, these are based on modest estimates from the Canadian Real Estate Association. A typical family in Ottawa will have to come up with an extra $1,000 a month when they go to renew their mortgage. So once again, has the government been briefed on how many Canadian families are going to lose their home because of the Liberal-caused inflation? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Tourism. Mr. Speaker, once again, the Conservatives don't seem to understand that while the prices uh, of things continue to rise in Canada, we need to be there to support Canadians. Mr. Speaker, Canadians are seeing higher prices at the grocery stores, and that is why we doubled the GST tax credit. That is why the Competition Bureau is currently beginning the investigation process into the market. That is why supermarkets across this country have frozen their prices, while the Conservatives are, are working on their next gimmicky lines. Mr. Speaker, we are serious about a serious issue in this country, and we're taking real action. The Honourable Member for Mégantic-Lérable. Mr. Speaker, there are people who are unable to buy groceries at the end of the month. There are people who are paying $800 more per month for their mortgage payments, Mr. Speaker. That's not a gimmicky line. That is is it's about uh, the livelihood of Canadians because, Mr. Speaker, this government has spent billions of dollars. It has created inflation. It has increased interest rates, which means that now every single Canadian has is having trouble. Mr. Speaker, how many families are going to have to go bankrupt because of this NDP Liberal coalition? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, it's... 
it's been barely 12 hours since the Conservatives voted against a measure to put more money in the pockets of Canadians. Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives' economic plan is to rob our pensions, is to attack the EI system in this country, and the Conservatives don't have the don't have Canadians' interests at heart. The Honourable Member for Mike Ansiklerham. Mr. Speaker, since the beginning of the question per of question period, par the Parliamentary Secretary has not once answered, not once, the uh, questions we have been asking her. That is, how many uh, families will be bankrupt at the end of the month because of the inflationary policies of uh, this NDP Liberal coalition? These families are not able to pay their uh, mortgages at the end of the month. In Montreal, for an ag average family, we're talking about $800 more per mortgage payment every single month on a, f a house that is worth $500,000. Mr. Speaker, through you, how many speakers are going to, how many Canadians are going to have to turn in their keys because of the inflationary policies of this government, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary? Mr. Speaker, we. Uh, said in this House that we wanted to cut taxes for low-income families. The Conservatives voted against that when we moved the Canada, the Canada Child Benefit, which puts more than $13,000 in the pockets of uh, lone, single, uh, lone parents. The Conservatives voted against it. And yesterday, they voted against additional measures to help Canadian households. Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives need to look in the mirror and realize that they don't have the interests of Canadians at heart. The, deputy de the Honourable Member for Manicouagan. Mr. Speaker, another day at the Public Order Emergency Commission and more evidence that the police forces did not want the Emergencies Act. A text message exchange between the RCMP Commissioner and her OPP counterpart reveals that on February 5th, the police forces were already worried about the federal government's plans. This is what the RC RCMP Commissioner said about the Emergencies Act. This is not something that I want. So why did the government invoke the most extreme of all Canadian statutes against the will of the RCMP? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we invoked the Emergencies Act because it was a decision that needed to be made. It was to protect uh, Canadians' health and safety. And uh, what the testimony has showed is that... Uh, there were challenges around the disturbances that were affecting workers, families, vulnerable Ottawans, and that is why we invoked the Emergencies Act, and we're going to collaborate with the Commission. The Honourable Member from Aniquaga. Mr. Speaker, the Commissioner's text messages also showed that during the very first week of the occupation in Ottawa on February 5th, the federal government was already considering invoking the Emergencies Act. But on fe February 5th, the blockade of the Ambassador Bridge in Windsor hadn't even happened. That started on the 7th. So when the federal government claims that it had to invoke the Emergencies Act because it was a national crisis, that is simply untrue. Mr. Speaker, the Emergencies Act had never been invoked because it's supposed to be a statute of last resort. So why did the government use it as a first resort and against the will of the police forces? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, with all due respect for my colleague, the decision to invoke the Emergencies Act was a last resort. And that is exactly what the testimony before the Commission has been showing. There were many negative impacts on workers, on families, and on vulnerable Ottawa residents, including uh, not just in Ottawa, but in Windsor. It, so we invoked the Emergencies Act because it was an unprecedented situation, and it was necessary. Rathcona. Premier Danielle Smith is once again attacking public health care in Alberta, stating that she will pull Alberta out of federal programs she doesn't like and pushing an American-style private health care system, a system that will not help anyone but the wealthy. I'm just, I'm just wondering relevance on the, on the question on public administration. So, so maybe I'll just allow the member to maybe rephrase it in somewhat that has to do with government, government orders. The Honourable Member of Edmund Strathcona. 
Conservative Premier Danielle Smith is yet again threatening Alberta's public health care system, stating that she will pull Alberta out of federal programs she doesn't like. Federal programs like the Canadian Health Act. And to make matters worse, the federal government is doing nothing to stand up for Canadians' fundamental right to health care. When is the government going to step up and protect Albertans from conservative attacks on our universally accessible, publicly delivered health care system. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for the question, and I, and I join with her in believing that our, our publicly funded, cherished health care system is part of the identity of being Canadian. The Can Can Canada Health Act is very clear. There are the five provisions that have to be seen in order to have a transfer. So I hope that I hope that the, the that that the premier listens to us when we meet uh, in two weeks in Vancouver, and that that her colleagues will let her know how important the Canada Health Act is to all Canadians. Order. Order. Thank you. The honourable member for Vancouver East. Under the Harper government, the cost of buying a home increased by 77 per cent. It doubled under the Liberals. The average rent in Canada is now over $2,000 a month. Families just can't afford it. Both Conservatives and Liberals allow for the financialization of housing to go unchecked, treating housing as a stock market instead of a necessity by allowing corporate landlords to evict people from their home to turn a profit. Canadian Canadians deserve to find a home that they can afford. Will the Liberals stand with Canadian families and put a stop to the profiteering of housing? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my colleague for her question. And uh, yes, we can see that currently the uh, uh, that uh, speculation is raging on the housing market, and that's why the government put in place a bill to ensure that a 1% tax on residential uh, properties aparting, uh, belonging to non-Canadians will, so that will be put in place because we want to ensure that we are protecting our market here in Canada. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Peterborough Kawartha. 1.47 million. That's the number of Canadians who accessed a food bank in one month. Wow. The highest number in history ever. One in three of those users are children. And what's the Liberals' plan for relief? More tax. They want to triple the carbon tax on groceries, triple the carbon tax on home heating, triple the tar carbon tax on gas. Will they commit, commit to ending their triple, triple, triple carbon tax increase, or do they want more Canadians using a food bank? Yeah. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague for raising a very important issue. Uh, this is a matter that should concern every member of this House and actually concern all Canadians. The fact that she said that families are struggling uh, feeding their family but also kids is something that is of concern to all of us. That's why, Mr. Speaker, back in, in May, I asked the Competition Bureau to look at the issue that we're seeing around competition in the country and more recently asked them to launch an investigation to make sure there's no unlawful practice. But in addition to that, Mr. Speaker, I did speak to the number of CEOs around the country to make sure they do their part to lower prices for Canadians. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Peterborough Kawartha. Mr. Speaker, I, I appreciate the member's attempt to answer the question, but that's not an answer for why we have a trillion dollar debt. It's not an answer when we have an increase in carbon tax, when four million Canadians rely on propane and oil to heat their home. This is not a luxury. This is a necessity. The average family is going to pay seven thousand dollars to heat their home this winter Whoa. they have to choose between heating and eating so again i ask will the liberals finally show leadership fiscal responsibility and compassion and stop the tripling of their carbon tax the honorable minister of environment and climate change Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to quote uh, uh, from the, uh, an article that the new Director of Communications for the Conservative Party of Canada uh, wrote, and he said, by, but opposition to a policy is not a policy in and of itself. And he added, Conservatives are refusing to contribute anything to the climate change discussion other than throwing temper tantrums and scoring political points. Mr. Speaker, I agree with the new Director of Communications for the Conservative Party of Canada. Yeah, yeah. The Honourable Member for Perry Sound Muskoka. 
Mr. Speaker, the NDP Liberal Coalition has racked up over $500 billion in inflation-causing wow. deficits, turning essentials like heating our home and eating healthy food into luxuries. Just as Canadians are starting to pay the high skyrocketing price to fuel their homes, skyrocketing visits to food banks are happening in Canada as well. When will this costly coalition stop hurting Canadians and cancel their inflationary spending? The Honourable Minister of Innovation. Yeah, we would all agree that our colleague is bringing an important issue. Uh, we are all seized by the fact that the price of food in this country has been increasing. Mr. Speaker, that's why we took action. Uh, earlier this year, I asked the Competition Bureau to look whether there would be any unlawful practice in this country. More recently, I demanded that they start an investigation to make sure that uh, we monitor what's going on in the market. But more recently, Mr. Speaker, what matters to Canadians, we took action. I did speak to CEOs of the large grocery chain in this country to make sure they lower prices for Canadians, because this is a matter that everyone should do their part to lower prices for families. Member for Perry Sound, Muskoka. I, I cannot believe how tone deaf that answer. He's talking about cell phone bills when people can't afford to eat and heat their homes. This coalition would have people believe that that it, more inflation-causing borrowing to give Canadians $500 to help them pay for thousands more dollars in groceries, thousands more dollars for heating their homes, and thousands more to pay their mortgage is actually a solution. It's like the left hand doesn't know what the far left hand is doing. How many Canadians have to lose their homes before they get it and cancel their inflation-causing borrowing? The Honourable Minister of Innovation. Mr. Speaker, maybe my English is not so good, but one thing that I'd say is I did speak to CEOs, the CEOs of the grocery chain in this country, Mr. Speaker. Grocery. I did speak also to the telcos, actually, to make sure that we would reduce prices for Canadians should this merger go forward. But, Mr. Speaker, beyond that, this is not a political issue, Mr. Speaker. We are concerned. They are concerned. Every Canadian is concerned. What, is, what matters to Canadians, Mr. Speaker, is that we all do our parts. We asked the grocers to do their part. We asked the producers to do their part. And I've even called upon the companies who have increased prices at the time that Canadian families are struggling. We'll fight for Canadians at every step of the way. The Honourable Member for Lévis Lobinier. Mr. Speaker, this government's inflationary choices are, are forcing Canadians to tighten their belts. The increase in, in the expenses of an average Canadian family with a $400,000 mortgage up to 5.5 percent means they'll have to pay $20,000 more this year. Mr. Speaker, will the government give Canadians some breathing room? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, I agree with my Conservative colleague that uh, Canadian households are having trouble, and that is why we doubled the GST tax credit for 11 million Canadian households. And that is also why we voted in favour on um, this side of the House for measures that will put more money into Canadian families' pockets. Mr. Speaker, I still don't under understand how the Conservatives can rise in this place and say that Canadians need our help, whereas they vote against the measures we put forward. The Honourable Member for Libye Lubinier. Mr. Speaker, that is uh, Canadians are not calling for a partisan response. They're calling for action. Mortgages are up, gas is up, groceries are up, heating prices are up, and everything is up. Mr. Speaker, will the Liberal government pledge to not increase the taxes of all Canadians? <laughs> The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, I think that my colleague is getting all excited because next week we're going to unveil our economic update. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, that update is going to be fiscally responsible. We have one of the lowest deficits in the world, Mr. Speaker. We're talking about 1 percent. We were fiscally responsible in our April budget, and we will be as well in our update, and we'll be there for Canadians to help them weather this period of instability. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Repentigny. Mr. Speaker, the UN this year published another scathing report on climate change. It put together all the, pl the plans of all countries to fight climate change, and climate change, and it is, is and it shows that we are very far from our 1.5 degrees target. 
we're going to, the minimum rise will be 2.5 degrees, and that's only if the countries respect their plans. But Canada has just announced in Washington that it's going to accelerate gas projects to export more to Europe. Does the minister realize that when the UN is asking for, for that the UN is asking for climate change cuts, not increases? The Honourable Minister, thank you very much. I'd like to thank my colleague for her question. Now, I'm quite confused by her question because the leader of her party uh, said in an article on Radio Canada that uh, the environmentalists in Quebec are angry at uh, the leader because uh, he questions uh, climate change. And so we believe in the, in the climate change science, and we have taken serious measures to fight climate change. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Opatsigny. I don't think the minister understood my question because I was talking about oil. The minister was on Les Coulisses du Pouvoir, Pouvoir Sunday, and he was questioned about Canada's plan, which was announced in Washington, to expedite oil and gas projects. The minister could have uh, said, to be clear, that no, Canada would never do that in the midst of a climate crisis. But on the contrary, he explained how he, as an environment minister, could advise oil and gas companies to help them to get through the assessment project rather process more quickly. Now, how many other oil projects is he planning to approve, the Honourable Environment Minister? Mr. Speaker, the leader of the Plebecois, when he was Minister of Environment in Quebec, uh, sidestepped environmental assessments on uh, the project in Gaspésie. He circumvented the environmental assessment on, uh, the, on Line 9 in in Enbridge, and he sidestepped his own law, Mr. Speaker, when he is environment minister in Quebec on uh, drilling in Anticosti. So I think uh, the uh, Bloc Québécois doesn't need to teach anyone lessons on that. The Honourable Member for Sherwood Park for Saskatchewan. So I thought the Prime Minister loved vacations, whether it's visiting the Taj Mahal, flying to private islands, surfing on Truth and Reconciliation Day, or spending $6,000 a night on a hotel room in London. But at the same time, his overpriced Arrive Scam app kneecapped Canadian tourism, and now he's forcing Canadians to cancel a visit to Grandma or a trip across town by tripling the carbon tax. How is it fair for the costly coalition to overtax and block travel by Canadians while continuing to fund the Prime Minister? Extravagance. The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, throughout the pandemic, this government put in place the measures that were necessary to protect the health and safety of Canadians. We made sure that we introduced CERB. We made sure that we introduced wage subsidies. We made sure that we introduced rent subsidies to keep businesses alive, to make sure that we could protect workers. And yes, and at the border, we also put in place the measures that were necessary to facilitate travel to keep our economy going, and that include Arrive Can to protect the health and safety of those travelers who were coming into Canada. Mr. Speaker, we will always use evidence, science, and medicine as the bedrock of our decisions while Conservatives fight a war against it every day. Gentlemen, Member for Sherwood Park, for Saskatchewan. Mr. Speaker, they also made sure they found a hotel in London that cost six thousand dollars a night. I'm seriously trying to imagine what you could get for six thousand dollars a night. It must have been a just incredible time. Did champagne come out of the faucet, or was he busy planning his leadership campaign? Did the bill include the cost of bail for the Minister of the Environment? I'm sure it was such a wild time that Bill Morneau could have written a whole book about it. Could the House know once and for all? If any sleeping took place, who slept in the $6,000 a night hotel room? The Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, the official Canadian delegation to the Queen's funeral included the Governor General and former Prime Ministers. All members of the official delegation, including two Conservative Prime Ministers, stayed at the same hotel that could accommodate its size during extremely high demand. As always, Mr. Speaker, our government made every effort to ensure that spending on official trips is responsible and transparent. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Stormont Dundas, South Glengarry. Mr. Speaker, this morning in a stunning decision, the Supreme Court of Canada has struck down a criminal code requirement that sex offenders be automatically added to the sex offender registry. This should terrify every woman, every victim of sexual assault, and every parent in this country. We cannot spare a moment to fix this massive public safety issue. What will the Liberals do to guarantee that every single sex offender is always on the National Sex Offender Registry? Yeah. 
Right, the Honorable Minister of Justice and Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for his question. Uh, obviously, uh, we as a government stand in support of, of survivors of sexual assault, sexual violence, and, and it is important that our criminal justice system uh, treat uh, and, and punish uh, offenders in the system. We have the, the Supreme Court decision this morning. It is complex. There are, there are a couple of different aspects to it, Mr. Speaker. We are looking at it carefully, uh, and, to, and we're looking at options in terms of how to move forward. The Honourable Member for Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry. Any woman, any victim of a sexual assault, and every parent in this country should be very concerned about that lack of a definitive statement to say we are going to guarantee that every single sex offender in this country is always automatically listed on the sex offender registry. Absolutely. That should be a given and that should be an easy statement for the minister to commit to this house to fix this problem immediately. I will ask again, what will he do and these Liberals do to ensure that every single sex offender, repeat or not, is always on the sex offender registry? This should be a given. Yeah. Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, last spring, when it was a question of the extreme intoxication defence, I moved immediately here, here. to make sure that we had legislation in this here, House here. to fix that gap. Mr. Speaker, these are complex issues. The, the decision came down this morning. There are a number of different important and different aspects to the decision. We will, we will support victims, Mr. Speaker. We will look at uh, the possible options that, that we have moving forward, and we will move forward, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cowichan, Malahat, Langford. Mr. Speaker, at record rates, families are being forced to turn to food banks because they just can't keep up with rising food prices. People are angry that their wages stay the same while rich CEOs are driving up costs to make millions. The Liberals have a responsibility to support Canadians. Instead, they've let CEOs hide their massive profits behind inflation. When will the Liberals tackle corporate greed in the grocery sector to help families with their food bills? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, there are a number of measures in our budget that will ensure uh, that everyone pays their fair share in this economy, but I do agree with the member opposite that Canadians are seeing higher prices at the grocery store, which is why our government took action, Mr. Speaker. In addition to doubling the GST tax credit for 11 million households in this country, Mr. Speaker, the Competition Bureau has indicated that it will take action thanks to the demands of this government. As well, Mr. Speaker, thanks again to the actions of our government supermarkets, many of them across this country will be freezing and have already, in some cases, frozen prices um, at the cash register, Mr. Speaker. These are measures that will support Canadians. The Honourable Member for Hamilton Centre. Mr. Speaker, it was thanks to the demands of the NDP, and while Canadians struggle to put food on their table, grocery giants are picking their pockets in order to line their own for Bay Street. In the first two quarters of 2022, grocery stores made an average of $1.5 billion while workers' wages stayed the same. That's twice as much as the pre-pandemic profits, and this year, food bank use rose to the highest levels in Canadian history, and yet rich CEOs keep cashing in. It's despicable. Yep. When will this Liberal government curb the appetite of corporate greed so that Canadians don't have to continue to go home hungry? Here, here. The Honourable Minister of Industry. Mr. Speaker, we share the indignation of my colleague on the other side. Obviously, we all want to do our part, obviously, to bring the price down for Canadians. But the difference, Mr. Speaker, is on this side of the House, we took action to make that happen. The first thing I did, Mr. Speaker, is back a few months ago, we did ask the Competition Bureau to look at unlawful practice in the sector. And more recently, my colleague would remember, I did write to the Competition Bureau to ask them to start an investigation. But in addition to that, I call the CEOs themselves and I ask them, do your part for Canadians. Canadian families are hurting. You need to do your part. CEOs are doing their part. We're doing our part. Why don't all members do their part to bring price downs to Canadians? The Honourable Member for Whitby. Mr. Speaker, at, at a time when the rules-based international order and democracy is threatened, the relation with our American counterparts is more important than ever. This week, the Minister of Foreign Affairs announced the first official visit to Canada by U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken. 
Could the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Foreign Affairs inform this House of the importance of this visit for Canada-U.S. relations? Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank my colleague from Whitby for his work and important question. More than ever, Canada and the United States are united as allies, partners, and friends. During this important visit, the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Secretary Blinken had the occasion to discuss the crisis in Haiti, the situation in Iran, the Arctic, investing in the Indo-Pacific, our continued collaboration on holding Russia accountable for its illegal invasion of Ukraine. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to face a world challenges together with one of our most important allies. The Honourable Member for Calgary Centre. Mr. Speaker, in August, Germany's leaders came to Canada begging us to help offset their dependence on Russian gas. Our Prime Minister replied, there is no business case for Canadian LNG. Sure. Au contraire, refuted Canada's actual business leaders. <laughs> the opportunity for tens of thousands of Canadian jobs is quite clear. With the world demanding Canadian energy, why is this Prime Minister berating Canada's clear opportunity. Great. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, Canada is committed to tackling the concurrent crises of global energy security and climate change, but we will do so in a manner that accounts for and works to minimize domestic emissions and do so in a manner that ensures any resulting emissions fit within Canada's climate plan. LNG is one of the tools in our toolbox and our government is committed to supporting the development of the LNG sector. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Calgary Centre. Well, that doesn't seem quite true. Coal experts from Russia have reached peak levels. China has also reached peak levels and gone up 300 million tonnes of coal production this year. Europe is cranking up coal plants. Why? Because the LNG that Canada could have supplied has been held up by this government's policies. Sure. Canadian LNG has a carbon put footprint half that of the coal that's ramping up around the world. When will this government get out of the way and provide the planet with the carbon emission fuel we need to decarbonize. Yeah. Honourable Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Mr. Speaker, I find it a bit rich to hear the member opposite talk about foreign oil imports. There was twice as more foreign oil imports under their leadership than today. So when they say they have the back of energy workers, the question is, which energy workers, Mr. Speaker? Saudi Arabia energy workers, Russia, Russian energy workers, or Canadian energy workers? Because under our leadership, oil exports have gone down by 50 percent, Mr. Speaker, and imports in investment in renewable energy and clean technologies have doubled since, since 2015. I think we have no lessons to, to receive from the member opposite on energy, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Battle River Crowfoot. Mr. Speaker, it is disgusting. The NDP Liberals have not learned their lesson. They continue on this dangerous crusade to shut down Canada's oil and gas sector, something that is not only e economically disastrous, but is dangerous for our world and bad for the environment, and puts my constituents as well as oil and gas workers from every province in the country out of work. Will this minister put an end to his activism and let Canada's oil and gas workers deliver the energy that this world needs! Yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, when we're talking about transition, we're not only talking about the future of the industry and sustainable jobs, we're talking about economic opportunities for communities across our country. Those enormous economic opportunities will be enabled through the transition to a low-carbon future. Those opportunities will vary by region. They are particularly in Alberta, and it will be based on local economies and geography. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Langley Aldergrove. Mr. Speaker, this uh, ideologically driven minister wants to leave our natural resources in the ground, and instead they want to mine Canadian workers' paychecks. I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, the last thing Canadian workers need is more inflationary taxation. Will these Liberals get out of the way of our hardworking oil and gas workers, and instead, will they do the right thing? Will they supply the world with clean and ethical Canadian energy? Here, here, here. The Honourable Minister of Environment. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to quote uh, an extract from a, an article that the new 
director of communications for the Conservative Party of Canada said, and he said, instead of scoring cheap political points on Trudeau's carbon tax, Conservatives need to get serious and offer their own alternative. I agree with the new Director of Communications for the Conservative Party of Canada, Mr. Speaker. I know. I, will, I know we can't use members' names in the in, in, in the area. Just, just a remind, just just a reminder that we can't use names, Prime Minister, Honourable Ministers, those kinds of things. Can, I, I, even if we quote, even if we quote, we can't use it. That's just a just a. It's a rule that's been around for a while. Uh, the Honourable Member, London of the. The Honourable Member for Lac Saint Jean. Mr. Speaker, the government expects 50,000 people to come into Canada through Roxham Road this year. That's not about to change, according to U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken. When asked yesterday, he didn't talk about fixing the situation at Roxham Road. Instead, he lectured Canada on having a greater sense of shared responsibility for dealing with asylum seekers. Mr. Speaker, did anyone in government explain to him that being responsible means making sure you're greeting people at border crossings, not on a path in the woods with the cops? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, look, it's our duty to protect Canadians and Quebecers and to provide for border safety and security. At the same time, asylum seekers have to be treated with compassion and the law has to be enforced in a regular way. The Safe Third Country Agreement is an important tool for managing migration and we're in constant communication with our U.S. counterparts uh, and uh, with regard to the Safe Third Country Agreement. The Honourable Member for Lac Saint Jean. Oh, we can see the cooperation is really going smoothly. Mr. Speaker, we see the government's once again taking no for an answer from the Americans. No to suspending and no to updating the Safe Third Country Agreement. They've been saying no since 2017. So it's time to take the next step. The agreement clearly states in Section 7, Section 10 rather, that the government can unilaterally suspend it. Since it's now clear the Americans aren't going to do anything about Roxham Road, when's the government going to tell them that we are suspending the agreement? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, let's be crystal clear. The closure of that road or suspending the agreement, those are not solutions because they won't solve the problem. As the member opposite knows, Canada shares the longest demilitarized border or unguarded border in the world. Asylum seekers are required to produce uh, identification, and this is an effort to prevent more dangerous crossings. What we are trying to do is modernize or update the agreement. Mr. Speaker, according to reports in the National Post, the Canadian Armed Forces was warned that the recent inoculation mandate may have been illegal. Mr. Speaker, will this Prime Minister commit to playing divisive politics with our troops and ensure that orders given to our military personnel are legal under Canadian law? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you very much, uh, um, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Member for the question. I think we all recognize that. Uh, the world has uh, just gone through a global pandemic that has threatened so many, so many lives, including the lives of Canadians. And we as a government had to take every step necessary to ensure that Canadians are safe and protected. That is why we made sure that we invested in vaccinations and got Canadians vaccinated as quickly as possible. That includes our Canadian Armed Force members as well, who took up, who took up that responsibility very seriously and made sure that they were inoculated so that they can continue continue to protect our great country. Thank you very much. Honourable Member for Sturgeon River Parkland. Mr. Speaker, text messages released to the Public Order Emergency Commission confirm that RCMP Commissioner Lucky sought to use a messaging app that would prevent deleted messages from being retrieved by investigators. I guess she learned a lesson from former Liberal operative Dan Bryan, who recorded explosive audio evidence that exposed the minister's attempt to inf interfere in a police investigation. The Liberals know they can hide their wrongdoing by using covert apps and deleting evidence, but Canadians are catching on to them. When 
When will the minister and the RCMP commissioner come clean with Canadians and stop the cover-up? Yeah. Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Emergency Preparedness. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, in this House, speculation, conjecture and innuendo are not facts. Only facts are facts. That's why perhaps the member opposite has omitted the fact that, for example, when the Commissioner asked the Commissioner Karik if I'd been in contact with him, he actually answered, no, that's a fact, Mr. Speaker. And here's another one for the benefit of all members. I never did. The Honourable Member for Sturgeon River Crow, uh, Parkland. Well, I guess we can never know, Mr. Speaker, because they stopped uh, taking recordings of their messages. Text messages released to the Public Order Emergency Commission are confirming a disturbing trend. The Minister of Emergency Preparedness repeatedly politicizing Canada's independent police forces with the complete cooperation RCMP Commissioner Lucky. Politicizing the deaths of Nova Scotians was just the beginning. Now we learn that the Liberals sought to use independent police forces to provide political cover for their invocation of the Emergencies Act after they had already invoked it. The Minister has crossed the line yet again. When will he resign? The Honourable Minister of Emergency Preparedness. I, I think, I think the, the weakness of the member opposite's argument is, is, is solely based on the fact that virtually everything he said is based on conjecture and innuendo. And, and there are no facts that, that have contradicted the statements that I have made to this House. I have confirmed to this uh, Order, order, order. Let's, we ask the questions. We should listen to the answers as well. The Honourable Minister of Emergency Preparedness. Mr. Speaker, it's quite apparent that the members opposite are afraid of the truth, and, and because it contradicts both their speculation and their innuendo. Mr. Speaker, I have been clear in this House that at no time, at no time, Mr. Speaker, did, did I ever interfere with the conduct and the operations of the RCMP. This has been confirmed by sworn testimony from the RCMP Commissioner. Mr. Mr. Speaker, the, the truth is that this, this, this interference never took place. It's a principle that we have always respected and always guarded. The Honourable Member for Lac Saint Louis. Mr. Speaker, this week was marked by the visit of the Chairperson of the African Union Commission, Musa Faki Mahmat. Our trade relations with Africa are key, and there are many opportunities on the continent for Canadian companies. Can the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of International Trade, Export Promotion, Small Business and Economic Development update this House on the trade situation and how Canada plans to strengthen our ties with Africa? Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for Lac Saint Louis for his hard work. This was the first ever high level dialogue between Canada and the African Union Commission. And there were many conversations. The relationship between Canada and the African Union is based on shared priorities of peace, democracy, sustainable development, health and economic cooperation. More than ever, we have to work closely together to ensure the resilience of our economies and that prosperity is shared by all our peoples. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Bose. Mr. Speaker, food bank use is rising by over 20 percent in Bose. One in five people who go to food banks are workers who can no longer make ends meet, whether it's the high cost of food with uh, pasta, flour, and so on skyrocketing. When will the government realize that Canadians are suffocating under these punishing taxes? Would they, uh, is, it, is it clear now, no new taxes? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague for his important question. We're all grappling with this issue, Mr. Speaker, and that's why earlier this year I asked the Competition Bureau to ensure that there was no unfair practices, practices going on in the food industry, and I also requested an investigation into that. Uh, I also asked the CEOs of the major grocery stores to do their share for Canadians. They're doing their part, we're doing our part, and I would call on the Conservatives to do their part as well and vote to support Canadian families and to lower prices. Mr. Speaker, Jan, a mother who lives in my riding, is worried about the carbon tax that now comprises over 64 percent of her energy consumption. With an ongoing cost of living crisis, 
Already struggling to make ends meet, soon we'll have to choose between food and warmth this winter. Mr. Speaker, will this NDP Liberal government choose, uh, cancel their planned carbon tax increase so hardworking Canadians like Jan doesn't have to choose between eating or heating this winter? The Honourable Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The cost of climate change to Canadians is in the tens of billions of dollars, and it seems like the Conservative Party of Canada doesn't understand that we're all paying for this, that there's no escaping it. And we have to address the issue of climate change as we address issues of affordability, which is why two weeks ago, th thanks to the Climate Action Incentive Payments, a family of four received $186 in Ontario, $208 in Manitoba, $275 in Saskatchewan, $269 in Alberta, and they will be receiving this four times a year, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston. Mr. Speaker, based on an email I received yesterday from his Parliamentary Secretary, I understand that the Minister for Public Safety will for the first time since the Liberals took power in 2015, be initiating a discussion with the RCMP on the subject of putting defibrillators into police cruisers. Oh, wow. Placing defibrillators in cruisers would save over 300 lives a year. That's 30 a month, so time is of the essence. That's right. Therefore, when can we expect to learn that a decision has been made one direction or the other? Thank Great you. Question. Great question. Uh, I want to thank my colleague for raising this an issue and I look forward to cooperating with him on it. Uh, I have engaged um, my office to be in touch with the RCMP to ensure that they have all of the tools that they need and in the meantime we have continued to make historic investments in frontline officers so that we can ensure consistency of police, policing excellence right across this country and again I underline uh, my, my gratitude to the member for raising this question. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Malpac. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Indigenous peoples deserve a justice system that treats them fairly and takes into account their reality. Recently, our government made an important announcement in Manitoba, addressing the overrepresentation and overincarceration of Meti people in our justice system. Can the Minister of Justice tell us more about his recent announcement concerning the Red River Meti? The Honourable Minister of Justice. I want to thank the Honourable Member from Malpec for this question. It's good to see that the tradition of strong representation from Malpec continues, here, here. Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Standing. Standing. Mr. Speaker, earlier this month we announced a significant investment of $1.68 million to address several issues related to the overrepresentation of Red River Metis people in the justice system. The Manitoba Métis Federation will use this money for programs that will help prevent and reduce crime through diversion of offenders out of the criminal justice system with appropriate supports, and these, invest these investments will also help families through the establishment of Métis Mediation Services. Mr. Speaker, I think everyone in this chamber agrees that we need to fight the overrepresentation of Indigenous peoples in the criminal justice system. This is part of it. Bill C-5 is another. The Honourable Member for Port Moody Coquitlam. Mr. Speaker, the crisis in our health care is getting worse by the day. Emergency rooms across the country are shutting down and are so stretched that families are forced to wait 10 to 20 hours to get emergency care. This cannot continue. The Liberals must act now to protect and expand our health care system. When will this government show leadership and invest the necessary funding to ensure Canadians are getting the care they need when they need it? The Honourable Minister of uh, Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for the question. And, and as you know, the health ministers will be meeting shortly in, in two weeks in Vancouver. We look forward to that meeting as, as it, a lot of the issues that, that the member has raised in terms of particularly the, how we expand health human resources, how we deal uh, with the kind of health transformation that will get people the most appropriate care in the most appropriate place by the most appropriate provider at the most appropriate time. We're all working together on that and we, we, we look forward to those deliberations. The Honourable Member for Richmond, Arthabasca. Mr. Speaker, all of us in our constituency offices are hearing from desperate people affected by illness. All parties agree we need to extend financial assistance to Canadians with serious illnesses. In the last budget, the government announced that sickness benefits would be extended to 26 weeks. This was to be in place by summer or fall 
of 2022. Unfortunately, it hasn't been done yet. Can the minister tell us when this highly anticipated extended benefit will be available? The Honourable... Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And one of the things in which the government has been doing is taking a look at a number of different uh, uh, ways in which we can enhance things, such as the EI uh, uh, benefits uh, for Canadians, and uh, also into consideration. We we do take into consideration what it is that the member has uh, risen uh, today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And that's all the time we have for question period today. And as I'd like to get going with the uh, daily routine of business, I'm going to ask people to take their conversations outside or just try to be quiet as uh, we proceed. Daily routine of business, tabling of documents. Depot de Introduction of government bills. Déclaration de ministres. Report interparliamentary delegations. Presenting reports from committee.